Welcome to the second part of 22 live stream hacks, tricks, tips and techniques for churches on a budget. We've already covered nine tips in the first video, so definitely check that out if you've not seen it yet. But these tips are in no particular order, so feel free to jump around. A list of all the contents and timings can be found in the description. We finished off part one by looking at some creative cameras for content creation and studio cams. And in that we looked at some really nice options if only we had enough cash. Obviously, with church, we don't always get to use the cameras and lenses that we'd really like. So if that's the case and you want something a bit more basic, stripping things back can really help. A blank wall can actually look very professional as the minimalism it provides does solve a lot of problems. It creates a blank canvas for graphic design. It eliminates distraction and clutter and actually provides the same function as that beautiful shallow depth of field that we all crave. It throws all the focus and attention onto the person in front of the camera, which is exactly where it should be. This is a great approach if you don't have a nice fast lens on a mirrorless camera. It'll still look really clean and really professional, especially if you have some nice lighting. If you do start to set dress, just make sure you consider your layout with all the on-screen graphics so there's no conflict. A nice clean background also means you can really easily clone your background when you need to, to extend the frame. It's a really simple way to edit slides right into the scene and anything else. Um, you can just create all that negative space when you need to. This is super easy in Photoshop. You start by exporting a frame from your editing software, taking that into Photoshop where you can extend your canvas size and fill in the blanks with a content aware fill. And you can touch it up with some of the other tools if you need to. Once you're happy with your background, you can save it as a Photoshop file, retaining all your layers, and in Premiere, drop it right into the timeline behind your original footage. Crop and feather the edges of the video on top, and then you're all set to reposition the person on screen, creating loads of negative space. When it comes to minimal backgrounds, paper rolls are actually one of the easiest ways of achieving this, aside from just painting a wall. We use wall mounted brackets and change from Manfrotto. They're really sturdy, they're really good value, and uh, stands can actually be quite expensive. We're also using paper roll from Tanito, where you can go for any color you like, including chroma key green, where maybe your kids team can have loads of fun with all sorts of alternate backgrounds in their content. Green screen is not as hard as you might think. The main thing is to light the background separately from your subject, basically so there's no shadows cast on the green paper roll. The soft boxes we're using for lighting are very much at the cheaper end of the scale. And in Premiere, you can just drop the ultra key effect on it and sample the color. A minute or two playing with a few settings got a very clean result in this instance. Not sure if you'd ever want to use this for the like the grown-up stuff, but for kids certainly. If you do go down that route, just take some inspiration from Justin Bieber and Ed Sheeran in their video, I Don't Care, where the green screen treatment is so bad, it goes all the way back around the scale to being awesome. Make it fun, make it humorous, make it low budget. Our kids team have started getting creative with green screen and it's super fun watching what they come up with. All this was shot on their mobile phones and put together very quickly in post. One thing that they found in doing this is that it's taken a lot of the pressure off their hosting as now a lot of the dynamics and the fun comes from the set itself rather than purely their own performances on screen. Now this is the weather where we talk about what is going on in the family life at King's and as you will see we have some pressure pushing down from Westminster ensuring social distancing remains Okay, I've just come back from lunch. I've realized I've actually made a catastrophic error. I was filming in HD rather than 4K. Actually, this does lead on to a pretty good point that even if you're streaming in 1080, shooting in 4K is still really useful. It gives you the ability to punch in and actually create a couple of different camera angles in one shot. So you can actually mask your edits when you make a mistake. You can just make things flow seamlessly even if you do need multiple takes. 
Okay, that was obviously a ridiculous example, but it was genuinely nine completely separate takes. Hopefully it shows that it is possible to patch things up reasonably well if you have a high resolution image to play with. The most important thing is to get the vocal track sounding natural. If you can play the audio back with your eyes shut and you can't tell where the edit points are, that's a pretty cool place to start. Then you just punch in and out to create that contrast. One of the advantages of video is that it allows you to be way more articulate and communicative than you could ever be in real life, which is good news for everyone watching. And especially with my videos, especially when it's me on camera and I struggle to speak English at the best of times. And whatever you're shooting, 4K allows you to really punch in when you're editing, meaning you can get certain shots even when you don't have the right lens on your camera. In terms of resolution, a 200% scale equates to a full HD image and 300% is 720. These are still very usable resolutions, especially when they're just short, sharp clips in your edit. A very useful little tip if you are wanting to shoot in 4K, but you've actually got a bit of a slower computer, and that's to encode proxy files. Proxies allow you to use low resolution compressed video files in place of your original footage to speed up workflow. You can toggle them on and off with a single click and anytime you export a frame or a sequence it will always use the original high resolution footage. It's really easy to do in Premiere which is the software I'm familiar with. You just grab your footage, you right click, you select create proxies. The best setting to go for is actually under QuickTime, go to ProRes and choose the proxy version and you can choose one of those formats. ProRes does actually spit out a slightly larger file size than other ones like H.264, uh, but the way it's encoded is actually much kinder to your computer and actually software like Premiere will play it back much smoother, even though the file size is a little bit bigger. The reason I was actually in HD is because I was trying to figure out how to get a picture from my Sony a7 III into the Blackmagic A10. We've tried plugging in Sony and Canon mirrorless cameras and actually they don't work, which is really frustrating. This took me ages to figure out, but it's totally possible. And it's actually really worth knowing. If you're drawn to the Blackmagic studio cameras, which are really good value by the way, you need an A10 video switcher with SDI in and out. On this particular model, everything needs to be in the exact same format. So we've got it set to 1080p at 25 frames per second and every video feed going into the ATEM needs to be that. And that of course sounds simple enough. The problem is that the HDMI feed coming out of the camera on a Sony a7 III is 50 frames per second no matter what your settings are if you're in power mode. Which I have to say is a little bit rubbish but there you go. The way around it actually is to use this um, mini converter which is called the up down cross HD and it'll basically take any signal and and convert it to the format you want. So this actually should work, but I wasn't getting a signal through. So I actually try plugging in a repeater as well. And that totally worked. Turns out the signal just needed a little bit of a boost. That got the signal through to the ATEM. Sometimes it's the little things that help you out. When it comes to streaming on YouTube, increasing your bitrate will only improve quality to a certain point before YouTube caps it. A little test reveals that streaming at 12 megabits per second produces the same picture quality compared to streaming at six. So if you haven't got the best upload speeds like us, just know that going beyond six megabits per second doesn't actually improve your stream anyway. It just makes it more likely to buffer. YouTube actually recommends a max upload of six megabits per second when you're in 1080. It turns out that's much more than a guide. It is actually a hard limit. You may be completely zoomed out by now, but there is one little trick that can take it to another level. You can use all the advanced features of your streaming software and send it directly into Zoom, where you can use that as your audio and video feed. So now you can do everything you can do with a live stream, like video playlists, slides, lower thirds, picture in picture, or switching between multiple cameras. To do this in Wirecast, simply turn on your virtual mic and camera, select it in Zoom as the inputs, and that's it. 
You want to check that the video is not flipped, that you're streaming in HD and that original sound is switched on. And there's a couple of extra settings in the audio tab that you'll want to check. The quality is actually surprisingly good. It's obviously not as good as streaming on YouTube or Vimeo or anything like that, but for what it is, not bad at all. Two-way communication rather than a one-way broadcast. Great for things like prayer meetings. Okay, check it out. Our loft room has never looked so clean and tidy because after 18 months or so, we're finally gonna be able to get ahead with our building project and convert our existing loft room into a better loft room and get three legitimate separate bedrooms, which our kids are super excited about because they won't have to share with each other anymore. So things are definitely on the up. That was obviously some completely irrelevant information, all for free, um, but something more useful and just a little thing really is that going live on a Sunday morning actually gets you significantly more views than if you upload something pre-recorded and maybe two to three times as much. YouTube just seems to favor the live content. And obviously views isn't the best measure of success. We're all after something much deeper ultimately. But at the other end of the scale, you know, none of us want to create video content that no one watches. So live content is definitely one nil up from the pre-recorded stuff. Okay, I might need to slightly eat my words. Since our church has opened back up, our concurrent views on YouTube has dropped from about 180 to 80. And in that, YouTube has stopped promoting our stream. Now we get much more predictable views every single week. It's around 350 to 400. Never spikes into the thousands but hopefully this is still useful information. Somewhere between those two figures, 80 and 180, there must be a point where YouTube decides it cares and actually starts to promote your stream as a recommended video. In any case, what's also interesting is where our concurrent views has dropped by 100, around 325 people have actually returned to our church 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning. And that hopefully gives a good ballpark for what a concurrent viewer represents. For each device connected, perhaps there's two to three people watching at the other end. At a guess, hope that's still useful in some way. Okay, just like that, this is the end of part two. I'll see you in part three. If it's not on my YouTube channel already, it will be there shortly.